Jason Matheny is approaching his one-year anniversary as the CEO of RAND. RAND is a federally funded research organization founded after World War II that now has 2,000 employees and a $350 million a year budget. Today, we're going to discuss institutional design, public policy research, government capacity, and existential risk. Previously, Jason led the Biden White House's policymaking on technology and national security at the NSC and OSTP. He also founded CSET and directed IARPA, which develops advanced technologies for the U.S. intelligence community. Jason, welcome to China Talk. Thanks, Jordan. It's great to be on. I've been a, a big fan of your work for years um, and really have enjoyed your, your podcast. So it's great to be talking. Well, thank you so much. That's very flattering. Um, so you uh, wrote in your sort of like welcome to RAND letter that you idolized the organization since you were 18. It's a very different organization from the 50s and 60s, or maybe not that different. I guess we'll get into that over the next hour or so. But I wanted to start with a conversation sort of dwelling on the ingredients of what it takes to create a truly world-shaping organization. There is a paper by Andy Marshall, as well as Augur and March, um, that came out in 2014, which actually you pointed me to, called The Flaring of Intellectual Outsiders, an organizational interpretation of the generation of novelty in the RAND Corporation, which tries to come up with like a vague framework for how RAND, as well as other organizations like Bell Labs, were able to catch magic in a bottle. Um, so I think it might be kind of fun to go through their theories one by one, and maybe you can sort of reflect on your past experience founding research organizations, as well as the sort of challenges and opportunities you're seeing at RAND today. So we got five. Research as, as a source of practical ideas, a culture of optimistic urgency, solicitation of renegade ambition, recruitment of intellectual cronies. And the fifth is the facilitation of combinatorics of variety. Let's start at the beginning. This research as a source of practical ideas. Wolstetter, one of the famous uh, researchers uh, in the early days of RAND, said he was attracted to RAND because they had enormous latitude going on. And he was sort of shocked to walk in and see them publishing on super random stuff like geometry, which was very far from what um, uh, the Air Force probably thought they were signing up to when they wanted just, you know, better bombing targets and more efficient planes. Um, what is what is this uh, idea of research as a source of practical ideas mean to you, Jason? Yeah, I, I think first there was a sense that for, for Rand to attract really smart researchers, you had to give them enough latitude so that they could do, you know, basic research on geometry or, you know, on causal inference. Um, but you actually wanted them to work on practical problems uh, that were going to be relevant to U.S. policymakers. So in, in some ways, uh, the freedom was, um, was a way to get people in the door. And then a lot of the problems that had uh, practical utility were ones that are intellectually really interesting and really fascinating. Um, and so, you know, I think it's um, like finding these attractants for really smart people is, is really important. Self-determination is certainly one of those. Um, this kind of entrepreneurship that RAND has, where you know most of the researchers are picking their projects, they're self-organizing, they're not given much top-down direction. So I, I think that is an important sort of part of the, the recipe for a place like RAND. Yeah, I mean, this idea of if you weren't doing public policy research, you would be doing geometry, or you would be doing, I don't know, you'd be an ornithologist or something. It seems like very far from the ethos as I know <laughs> the, the the sort of normal Washington um, uh, Washington community. I, you know, it, it's um uh, kind of reflect on that. I think we're pretty um, clear with folks when uh, when they're applying to Rand that you know you'll be spending your time working on policy analysis. Um, uh, you won't be doing a ton of basic research, um, but you can do some. Um, and I think for people who um, who come from academia and want to be working on hard problems that are actually going to matter, it's it's great. Um, like they didn't just want to do, um, you know, uh, publications for, for peer reviewed journals that were making some methodological innovation that wouldn't actually impact an important decision. And they didn't want to be, you know, having to go through the whole tenure process um, in order to kind of, you know, achieve. Um, these uh, institutional goals for a university when what they really wanted to be doing was 
affecting some consequential policy in national security or education or healthcare. So I think there's a kind of selection effect where the, the folks who want to join RAND uh, might have come from an academic research background, but had been sort of dis dissatisfied with it um, because either it didn't have enough practical relevance or sort of the mix of practical relevance versus, you know, kind of research ambition um, or because they, they just got frustrated with the kind of incentive systems within academia that pulled them away from, from things with, uh, um, with some sort of policy impact. One of the things that RAND is, um, is, un, is just sort of unusual for is, I mean, because of our, our size, we have, um, you know, 2,000 people. Um, and because we work across so many different disciplines, there is this um, characteristic that w when somebody comes in to work, uh, you know, let's say that they're a labor economist and they came in because they wanted to work on um, labor displacement uh, in the United States as a challenge for the future. Uh, but then they see a colleague who's working on some really interesting um, analysis of labor um, and uh uh, dependency ratios in China. And then they say like, well, I'm interested in that project. So we do find a lot of people who um, come in the door because of one topic, but then quickly start working on a range of other topics. It's great. I think it's a great environment for, you know, informational omnivores, for, for people who are just broadly intellectually curious, even outside of the domain that they had specialized in, uh, maybe in their, in their earlier research career. So this idea of the combinatorics of variety, which you sort of alluded to that, um, you know, you take a lot of smart, curious people who may have different methodological backgrounds um, and they sort of peer over the desk at their colleague and, and realize, oh, like, here's a problem I might be able to um, learn from or have insight to. Um, even in 1960, uh, you had folks talking about how, you know, going from 200 to 1,000 um, made that a lot harder because you, instead of being like the one political scientist um, in the building, now there were 20 and you guys can all kind of like get lunch together. Um, I'm curious, Jason, uh, you know, how you're trying to fight that and keep that sort of multidisciplinary um, thing going, even, even as like the silos of people end up becoming larger. Yeah, yeah. I think this this is a really interesting question about like to what extent does does size present opportunities versus you know costs? And I mean, a, a few thoughts. I mean, one is you know early Rand wasn't wasn't that small. I mean, in the um, by the '60s, I think we had about you know 500 employees with hundreds of projects in any given time. Um, you know, Bell Labs had I think 15,000 employees in the mid '60s. So, I mean, you can have these, you know, highly innovative organizations that are that are large and that draw on the infrastructure of large institutions. Um, you know, I would, I would say, like, for example, CSET is relatively small, but it's within a much larger institution of Georgetown uh, that has thousands of people. So it's able to draw on that infrastructure. Um, but I think it is often the case that you see highly innovative groups within larger organizations. Um, and I think it makes sense to think about, well, what, what makes those groups particularly good um, at, at doing research or analysis? And there, there's also, I think, a lot of bang for the buck in thinking about what are the mechanisms or processes um, that allow groups of different sizes to be effective in producing research and analysis? What are they? Well, I think one of them is just having a sense, I, I, like, I love the term optimistic urgency, like actually having a sense that the problems that you're working on should be really important and can be really important. And that you're probably actually not duplicating other work. I think we tend to overestimate the number of people who are working on the most challenging and important um, problems. There was a guy um, at Bell Labs, Richard Hamming, um, who had sort of a lecture on this topic that he would give. He was kind of a he was sort of known for being um, uh, for sort of inviting himself to people's uh, lunch tables at Bell Labs um, and sitting down and asking people, are you all working on the most important problem? And if not, why not? <laughs> and, uh, you know, a lot of folks just kind of by inertia aren't necessarily working on the thing that they think is is most important. So I think first just freeing up people's um, uh sort of sense that they could be working on the most important problem. Let's stay on that for a sec. So um, 
this idea of picking the most important problems and, and working on them. You and other and other interviews have um, you know laid out this idea of catastrophic risk and you know preserving like increasing the chance of humanity um, existing, you know, 100, 500, 1,000 years from now being something that you'd really like to orient um, uh, research towards. I'm curious, you know, in today's RAND, um, you know, the the sort of blank check that I think the Air Force gave um, RAND in the 50s and the sort of latitude that you got from open philanthropy in the early years of CSET is not necessarily the same, um, you know, organizational structure that you're you're living with. So like, if you want to give your researchers the type of freedom, both, you know, to do the things that they think are most important, as well as try to, you know, orient this, 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 this broader ship more towards the things that, that you see are going to be most relevant over the next, um, you know, decade or two, um, you know, what are the kind of constraints you're operating under and how are you trying to work around those? Yeah, I think as a, as a percent of our, our total budget, I mean, it's true that, um, we're, we're more constrained um, than, say, early RAND um, or CSET. Um, but in, in absolute terms, I think there's as much or maybe even more, you know, unconstrained uh, funding um, here um, right now. I mean, thanks to, you know, foundation funding or, you know, especially um, ambitious analytic efforts that we're working on for places like the Office of Net Assessment. And I think that... Um, I think that the work that comes out of that is um, is some of the most um, you know interesting and uh, and I think effective of, of work at Rand. I mean, I'd, I'd say for example, uh, Mike Mazar's work on sort of the foundations of, of competitiveness is um, you know every bit as interesting as work that uh, Tom Schelling and others did at, at Rand. Um, I do think that the um, the the level of of general government oversight over contracts has increased a lot since the 1950s. Much of that for the better, I should say. Like, you know, as a taxpayer, uh, it did me more discipline as to how we were spending federal dollars, you know, immediately after World War II. But that does have a cost for, for analysis organizations. Now, I think there's there's still a lot of open-ended projects at, at RAND. Um, and we also have a lot of open-ended kind of positions at RAND. We just recently um, put out a call for applications for a technology and security policy fellowship, which um, is open and hope listeners who are interested in that topic will apply, where about 80% of the time is uh, is open to the fellows to decide how to spend it. Uh, it's pretty great. Um, I mean, there's very few things like this, you know, in the um, in the research world. And then 20% of the time is spent, you know, working on policy analysis for actual policymakers. So you get sort of the best of both worlds. You get the benefit of, of having some self-directed study and then the benefit of working on real projects that allow you to, you know, interact with an assistant secretary of defense or assistant secretary of state or, um, you know, other uh, senior policymakers. Hey, do you read? If so, I have one weird trick to make your life infinitely better. For years, I've had a, to be honest, more hate than love relationship with Instapaper and Pocket. I spend hours each day reading articles to get informed for the podcast, but the process of centralizing all that reading was so frustrating with these crappy apps. I just read less, spent more time on Twitter, and was dumber for it. Six months ago, I subbed out those apps for Matter, a modern reader and podcast capture, and have spent at least an hour a day on it ever since. The experience is clean, bringing in articles I find online as well as newsletters from my inbox, and it even allows me to highlight podcasts. As someone with vision issues who's a little more audio forward, getting pieces read to me in synthesized voices that sound really good is a game changer. If you download Matter, you'll read more, enjoy yourself while doing it, and just get smarter. Now, how many other apps can actually deliver on that? To learn more, go to getmatter.com or just search them in your app store for a better read. This Balance between independence and influence is another thing that Andy Marshall um, harped on, you know, as one of the keys to Rand's success. Uh, how do you think about the the, the trade offs there? Yeah, I mean, in, in some ways, Rand is probably more influential um, to more policymakers today than it was in the fifties and and sixties. Um, there there is a um, something that I guess Rand is 
is known for, which is pushing back on the questions we're asked and sort of saying, like, you're asking us the wrong question. The, the more important question is X, uh, not Y. And uh, we still do that. I mean, I think when, when a, a federal um, decision maker comes to us with a, a question um, and if we think that it's, it's not framed well um, or that there's a bigger question that deserves to be asked, uh, we'll, we'll provide that feedback. Now, ultimately, um, it's the sponsor that's paying us um, and uh, they own the question. Um, we, we sort of own the results. That is, we, um, we don't take direction on what the, the product of the analysis um, should be. That's something that we maintain really fierce independence on. Uh, but I think, I don't know, maybe a third of the time we're actually able to um, persuade the sponsor that there's a better framing for the question that it can actually help them make a decision um, in a way that's going to be um, more relevant. Um, there's also this, um, you know, I think there's the Eisenhower line about whenever I um, face a, a big problem, I try to make it bigger. You know, if you can solve the more general uh, class of problems, it, it not only can be more efficient analytically, it can also just sort of prevent certain kinds of mental shortcuts. So whenever we can, we try to make um, the more general case the topic of the analysis rather than the more tactical case. There's this great line by Andrew Marshall talking about the early years of RAND where he said that in some mysterious way, an urgent pressure for relevance became an urgent pressure for fundamental research and ideas that were relevant in the long term. It was as though a string quartet stranded in a winter snowstorm decided urgently to compose a new fugue rather than start shoveling. I mean, it's it's not easy to get uh, um, uh, a string quartet uh, to not shovel in a snowstorm. Right. Or is that just is that just all on the front end with hiring or how do you kind of uh, make sure that's that's still a uh, a piece of the puzzle? Yeah. I mean, I think first we it's uh, I mean, Andy was, I think, somebody who had a very particular view of a part of, of Rand. And I mean, not everybody at Rand felt that way about Rand. And I think if you know, if you read either Andrew <laughs> May's, you know, history of the early years of Rand, which I think is maybe the most complete history, um, you know, in his dissertation, or you read, as I've been doing, you know, memos from you know, across staff at Rand in the late 40s and 50s and even in the early 60s, uh, there were a lot of folks who sort of felt like, man, I feel like I'm just turning the crank um, on analysis that uh, is not going to be that, that relevant. But, but Andy Marshall, certainly, you know, his work um, and the work of, of um, you know, some of the other memorable figures at Rand were doing this you know, more general approach to strategic analysis. Um, I do think that the sense of, of urgency um, was, uh, was one that some RAND staff felt acutely, um, and it was driven in part by uh, the risks of the day that I think were sort of more collectively felt across the country, you know, that there was a, a real risk of, of nuclear war. Um, there were RAND staff who um, chose not to have a pension because they didn't believe that they would actually survive until retirement. They thought it was <laughs> more likely that they would die in a, a nuclear blast. Um, so it's, it's hard to, um, I think, you know, it's, it's certainly hard to recreate that sense of, of urgency that maybe was felt broadly in the 1950s and 1960s. Um, but I think there are, there are certainly parts of RAND that still feel that, that kind of urgency. Um, I'd say, you know, for instance, a lot of the folks here who are working on AI policy um, or biosecurity policy feel that sense of urgency. Folks who work on Taiwan analysis um, feel that sense of urgency. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's not to say that other folks are feeling sanguine about the portfolios that they're working on and education policy or healthcare policy. Those are those are urgent in a different way. I mean, we, you know, we're not all going to die if um, if we don't, uh, you know, get an education policy that's um, that's more effective. Uh, but it's a it's a sort of uh, it's, a, it's a lower and slower existential risk if we don't figure out those those problems um, that are that are really consequential for U.S. policy and global policy. So I think there's there's still this very high degree of mission focus and motivation. Um, at Rand and at a lot of these other institutions that are that are noted in that that article, um, you know, I think we we feel 
I, I think this is also a selection effect at RAND, is that you know people who, who come here want to be working on problems that are really consequential. Um, you know, maybe they want to make a methodological contribution along the way, um, but the main reason that they're here is because they want to solve a problem that's that's really important for humanity. Yeah. So the the sort of methodological innovations as being downstream of trying to stop a nuclear holocaust in the 1950s is one of the probably more remarkable things about um, what Rand could do. I mean, you can like. It's not shocking to get some like interesting nuclear policy or like bombing theories, but the fact that they, you know, came up with, uh, you know, all of these computer science innovations because they thought they had to model out, you know, a war. So they had to, you know, create like this, the world's second computer, um, all that sort of stuff. I'm curious, you know, you, you, you just mentioned that your researchers aren't necessarily the ones um, who have their whole lives wrapped up with methodological innovation. But I'm curious where you sort of see that in the firmament of the stuff that you're excited to do in the coming decade. Yeah, I think, you know, our work currently on decision making under deep uncertainty, I would say, is in this sort of category of, of sure. methodological innovation. Um, I think that's really important. It's it's um, it contrasts with with work that I had been involved with um you know, earlier on, you know, generating like pr precise probabilistic forecasts of events. This is sort of the other side of that. Like, let's say that you can't produce precise probabilistic forecasts and there are a lot of important problems in that category. Um, how do you make decisions that are more robust? Um, and I think there's a long line, as you note, of, of treating methodology as a tool that supports high consequence decision making. Um, the Delphi method would be an example of this, I think, still, you know, one of the most useful and probably underused tools for uh, judgment and decision making, a way of eliciting um, forecasts uh, or probability judgments um, and combining them um, in ways that are sort of less prone to groupthink and various kinds of biases. Um, that that type of work. Um, you know, continues here. And I think one of the things I'm really interested in building on is, are there other um, tools and processes that can advance analysis on the most consequential problems in policy that we're not yet widely using? Um, so whether those are, you know, crowdsource forecasts or prediction markets, whether it's prizes or bounties for finding um, analytic information outside of RAND, um, figuring out how to, you know, leverage the 8 billion brains that are outside of RAND seems pretty important. We're just 2,000 people here. So um, there's a whole lot more knowledge and expertise that's, that's outside of the organization. How do we leverage that? Um, how do we incentivize it? Um, and then certainly figuring out um, ways of applying um, the advances in large language models to analysis and everything from doing literature reviews to figuring out how to elaborate on an outline, how to generate hypotheses. I think large language models are just a, a really incredible uh, new research tool. Yeah, I was going to I was going to make the pitch for you guys being the AI for social science hub of the 21st century. I don't think universities are probably a little too fragmented to to make the sort of institutional bets that you'd need to um, to really um, to really do this right. You want to continue on that for a second, Jason? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, I, I can't speak to um, how universities are, are adopting, you know, language models, for example, for use in, in research. Um, my guess is it varies a lot and that um, probably there's some institutions that um, are going to be earlier adopters than others. We are working at RAND on, on making sure that all of our staff um, have, you know, exposure and training to uh, large language models that they think about the ways that they can help their work, not just on the research side, but also on the operations side. Um, and I, I think we're already seeing researchers, you know, start to to lean on these tools, you know, heavily in in their work. Um, I think that's only going to grow. Um, and I think, um, you know, as we see these tools become more capable, the number of applications, the ways in which they can boost analysis and, and serve as sort of an, an amplifier for the cognitive work that's being done by, by researchers here is going to grow. 
it still requires error checking. I mean, it still requires, you know, a lot of editing and a lot of checking of citations uh, to make sure that they're real citations and not hallucinations. Uh, but we've already seen the accuracy improve just over the last few months. I mean, we're seeing fewer of these hallucinated uh, references. We're seeing, you know, improvements in the ability to summarize a document well, um, create a, you know, annotated bibliography, find and synthesize uh, work in a domain that we're not actually sure is going to be particularly relevant to a, a piece of analysis that we're doing. So we wouldn't necessarily want to spend weeks surveying and summarizing, but we want to get, get the gist to know whether it's worth a deep dive. So being able to do that kind of analytic triage is yeah. something that these models, I think, are, are very helpful on. Um, and Jordan, I know you've done a lot of, of uh, experimentation with these models too. So um, I think you're, you're helping to demonstrate the value of some of these tools. I mean, it's, uh, it's not there yet, but what I think will happen you know, within two to three years is if you have someone whose mind is kind of nimble enough, like, as you said, Jason, you can, you can do the RAND multidisciplinary approach as like an individual, um, where hopefully you'll be able to set it up. Even if you're not a trained economist or sociologist or whatever, you, you know, you set up your question and, and tell whatever, um, RAND GPT, you know, as a RAND, uh, sociologists, like what are the sorts of things I would be looking at and, and yeah, giving researchers right. the power to, to, you know, load in new method, methodological approaches and, you know, pick and choose, I think is going to be, is going to be. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. I think that's right. Um, I want to come back to decision-making under deep uncertainty, um, which is a concept I've found really fascinating, but also like very, like a one that I'm worried is like very difficult for like a voting public or a politician to like internalize and be okay with. Um, uh, maybe for this example in particular, or, 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 or maybe you can take the answer more generally, like the, the, the process that Rand does of taking its, its, its research, which may have, you know, uh, nuanced, difficult, um, uh, and not necessarily the most politically palatable conclusions in trying to sell that to policymakers and the, uh, the country at large. Yeah. So, I mean, I'll give an example. We have a, a research effort at RAND uh, around something we call truth decay, uh, which is, you know, trying to analyze the general um, trend towards erosion of, of facts and evidence used in, um, in policy debates. Um, I mean, it's first there's been, you know, different measures of political polarization um, over the last few decades that's increased um, cultural polarization. Um, and there's, there's a decline in the way in which facts and evidence are used in debating policy substance, um, you know, on, in Congress um, particularly. And we've been doing a lot of work to understand what are the drivers for that and what are some of the, the remedies. And that's highly even asking the question can it can be politicized and i think you know rand is is pretty like theologically nonpartisan i mean i i i couldn't speculate as to like what the um uh what the broad political views are of, of most of the colleagues that i interact with uh every day i think it's like a point of pride for rand but in some cases even asking the question about hey what's happening you know to facts and evidence um, in, in policy debates is, is viewed as, as politicized. Um, I think, you know, one example of the application of thinking about decision-making um, under deep uncertainty is you want to find um, a set of methods that can help you make robustly good decisions, um, even when you're, you know, maybe radically uncertain about some key parameters. Um, and you know, one one example of this would be um, what are the timelines for different AI capabilities? Um, and we, we don't really know, um, you know, because researchers themselves are uh, are divided. I mean, I think it was um, it was pretty stunning, you know, earlier uh, this week when the um, statement on on AI risk from the Center of AI Safety was um, uh, was published because you saw. I think the the greatest degree of, of unanimity that I've seen um, in, among researchers describing um, AI as an extinction risk. Um, and 
I think if you if you go one bit deeper and and ask like, well, extinction risk on on what timeline, and what are what are the specific scenarios that we should be worried about? Is it you know AI applied to the design of cyber weapons? Is it AI applied to bioweapons? Um, disinformation attacks? Is it um, you know the mis- misalignment of AI systems? There you're going to see a much greater level of of disagreement. Um, uh, but to see, you know, most of the top 50 AI researchers in the world, you know, most of like the authors of like the canonical, you know, AI papers over the last decade, agreeing on this general point about AI being um, posing uh, potentially such a severe risk. I think that's the sort of thing that we should probably be thinking about more broadly, which is like, what but, are the but risks come on, that I... come on, Jason, you're the, um, uh, you're the Phil Tetlock, uh, prediction markets guy. You know, you can't trust the experts. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think even non-experts here would, um, would, uh, would agree more that these risks are increasing. Uh, I, I think it's probably, uh, I wouldn't characterize that like the main finding from, from Tetlock's yeah. and Meller's, um, work in forecasting, uh, tournaments, uh, is that expertise doesn't matter. I think it's just that that expertise tends to be distributed in ways that um, that might not always be correlated with these like kind of conventional markers. Like, you know, is it somebody who um, is a is a pundit who shows up, you know, to the morning news shows? Is it somebody who, um, uh, you know, has a, um, a newspaper column um, versus is it somebody who has actually like been thinking deeply about a problem, um, but uh, is is not a sort of you know world recognized expert on the topic, and what was fascinating about this uh, uh, tournament that um, that Tetlock and and Mellers and their team won over a four year period where we kind of um, this is at IRPA we organized this large uh, global geopolitical forecasting tournament um, I think the largest of its of its type it involved you know tens of thousands of participants elicited millions of of judgments. Um, what was really striking is if you want to make really accurate forecasts, involve a lot of people, uh, basically take the average. Um, and if you want to do even a little bit better than the average, you can assign more weight to people who have been more accurate historically or um, you know, find groups of so-called super forecasters who have a track record of accuracy. But even just taking the unweighted average of a large pool of people is is really a pretty great improvement over taking you know, the uh, group deliberation of a um, of a group of of assessed experts, um, and when we have done that sort of thing with um, with AI risks, I mean, if you look at some of the surveys uh, that have been done on AI risks, it's pretty sobering. And um, I think the sort of approach to robust decision making here would be first to think about well, what are the kinds of policy interventions that would help on different time scales, even if we don't have a great detailed sense of what the specific risks are. So for example, are there policy guardrails that can help reduce AI risk, uh, even if you don't have enough details about the specific risks? Um, so you know, some things are gonna be like, well, do better um, you know, red teaming and better like safety testing, um, invest in safety research, um, invest in lab security, um, you know, think really careful about this question of, of open sourcing, because uh, that's something that you can't really take back um, if you, dis- if you um, detect some like significant security issue or safety issue um, after a, a code release. Um, so I think there's a lot, of, um, a lot of these sort of robust approaches to policy that are, um, that are helped um, by this decision making under deep uncertainty in cases where we can't put precise probability forecasts. The thing I'm worried about is well i'm not worried about a lot of things um on deep uncertainty in particular it just seems like people in general politicians in particular have a hard time internalizing and accepting that like the future is uncertain and there are different ways things could play out and like you can't just you know guess that you can't just like assume on that one is right and i think one of the one of the the things i've i've noticed in particular about the um uh, um you know about the, the the congressional hearing so far around AI is it, it it's sort of very pattern matching on what happened with social media and it's also kind of very linear in folks thinking that like 
folks not sort of internalizing the potential for exponential increase in the power of these uh, of these platforms, as well as, you know, as you said, Jason, like the fact that it could be many different things under many different timelines, which end up, you know, uh, deciding whether the U.S. China, U.S. or China wins AI or whether it, you know, takes all the jobs away or makes every job better or this, that and the other thing. And just just getting to that step seems to be a real um, a real lift on any policy, uh, you know, uh, particularly AI, it seems. I think you're right. I mean, I, I think there is a general challenge in appreciating exponentials and, um, you know, just in life. Uh, I mean, it's just hard for all of us uh, to, to see um, if we're if we're actually part of a hockey stick, you know, curve on an exponential uh, because it doesn't look that way at first. Um, and uh, and it we're just not good at grasping um that I mean, our, our brains didn't evolve to um, to be able to understand um, changes that happen this rapidly, and we see this not just in in AI policy, but also in um, policy around synthetic biology that has you know its own version of of sort of Moore's law happening right now, its own kind of exponential improvements, um, and its own exponentials in terms of effects. I mean, as we saw during the pandemic, um, one in the early part of the pandemic, one of the things that's just hard to appreciate is, you know, doubling times um, that when you have infections that spread, I mean, when you have, you know, self-replication and things that are increasing exponentially, um, we we just think we still think linearly about this. We sort of think, well, we've got, you know, weeks to work this out when you've really only got days at the early part of a pandemic um, and and AI and cyber and um, and bio, I think, you know, share this, uh, this sort of general property of, um, you know, self-replication, potentially self-modification, um, things moving at an exponential, um, that makes policymaking, I think, especially challenging. You know, we had a pandemic, right? Like 2000s, 2010s, everyone's talking about oh, pandemics were scary. Now we had one and you just almost saw a debt ceiling deal which um, you know was very close to killing like the the best hope America has for you know solving uh, you know creating a nasal vaccine and solving um, uh, yeah. what we had. So I mean you know we, we were talking about Rand right like nuclear bombs went off all of a sudden Stalin had one that freaked people out uh, and focused minds. Um, the the AI community as you said is doing its darndest to 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 scream and shout being like guys this is a problem we really need to focus on it. Um, bio, it, it seems like it's having a harder time resonating at a time when you think it would be, um, care to reflect on that, Jason? Can you just blame Sam Bankman fried for all of this? Like, what's the, uh, um, what's the, uh, uh, what's the challenge here in getting people to, to be scared of a, of an engineered, uh, pandemic killing us all? Yeah. And, you know, the, the concern about this, of course, goes back decades. I mean, you had um, folks, you know, sounding the alarm on our, you know, vulnerability um, to uh, to infectious diseases, um, you know, going back, you know, even before the signing of the Biological Weapons Convention. I mean, this is part of the point that um, that Matt Meselson was making to Kissinger and Nixon for why um, why we needed a biological weapons convention is just that we are, um, we're a highly networked society. We're, um, we're, we're generally, um, uh, contrarian. So we don't like necessarily follow public health advice quickly as a society. And so we might be asymmetrically vulnerable to, um, infectious diseases, whether, um, you know, natural, accidental or intentional. And I think part of, um, part of what's striking is just that, you know, despite decades of, um, of pretty prominent biologists and public health specialists and clinicians sort of sounding the alarm on our vulnerability, um, we had not invested in the things that were you know, going to make the biggest difference for resilience um, and mitigation of pandemic risks. Um, and even after um, having over a million Americans um, die in a, in a pandemic, we still have not made uh, the kinds of investments that are going to meaningfully reduce the likelihood of future pandemics. So, yeah, what's driving that? I mean, I think part of it is um, there is a kind of pandemic fatigue um, right now in the policy community of, you know, there was, there was so much spent in 
addressing the economic impact of the pandemic. Um, and it was sort of saying like, aren't we done with this as a topic? Um, you know, can't we, can't we move on? And of course we can't because the, the probability of, of something at least as severe as, um, as COVID happening again is non-negligible. Um, and we've seen how costly it can be. I mean, over, you know, over a million deaths and over $10 trillion of, of economic damage. Um, and this was a, a moderate pandemic. I mean, this is a, a pandemic whose, whose causative virus had an infection fatality rate less than 1%. Um, we know of pathogens with infection fatality rates uh, that are much higher. I mean, you know, some 99%. Um, and the prospects of, uh, of highly lethal, highly transmissible uh, viruses that also have um, longer um, uh, uh, pre-symptomatic periods of transmission, uh, which makes uh, viruses particularly um, uh, dangerous. Those those uh, those characteristics um, now are amenable to engineering uh, because of advances in synthetic biology. So, um, I think the risks of a an engineered pandemic, you know, whether intentional or accidental, have have also grown. Um, while we still face you know, the specter of um, a pandemic that's of natural origins that's substantially worse than, uh, than SARS-CoV-2. I mean, the 1918 influenza, for example, killed somewhere between 50 to 100 million people in 12 months. Um, and it's, it's, it's not clear that we would be any more um, capable of uh, preventing such a pandemic today. I want to come back to this uh, question of like political risk that you face. Um, you know, every once in a while, uh, congressmen get up and they sort of wave around a paper saying, you know, what what is the U.S. government doing funding, you know, studying, you know, birds beaks or something. Um, of course, there was a, a, a huge uh, controversy that Rand got embroiled in in the missile gap around the um, uh, 1960 election. And you just mentioned truth decay, which is like, uh, you know, not super hard to read as something that has a political valence to it. So I guess I'm curious, Jason, how are you thinking about a political risk to saying things that uh, your um, funders on the Hill or in agencies may be angry enough to try to cut you off or put you or, or give you even more sort of like. Uh, you know, fewer degrees of freedom and more strictures around how you spend money going forward. Uh, we're celebrating our 75th anniversary this year. And one of the things I've, I've just been looking at, are, you know, one of the periods in Rand's history where we've had, you know, various uh, political backlash or policymakers who are unhappy with us. And, um, you know, we, we've had We've had ups and downs of that in the last 75 years. I actually don't think it's um, it's been worse today in terms of like you know feedback or pressure that we get um, politically uh, than it has been historically. And I think part of the reason for that is the um, the people who are who are generating most of the questions for Rand, um, the the folks within government are mostly civil servants. They're they're folks who are not highly politicized. They're folks who are not turning over from administration to administration. I mean, they're people who are, have been, you know, spending 20 years working on a set of really hard problems related to, you know, defense policy or national intelligence um, or education policy or the other things in our portfolio. So um, every once in a while, we'll get some, you know, angry letters uh, from folks about some analysis that we do, but we, we keep on, we keep on working. Um, and I, I do think that our, our reputation, our credibility um, in, in both uh, parts of our political spectrum have, have been maintained pretty well over the last, um, you know, 75 years. I, I think we're just generally viewed as um, being a set of nerds who are like just really committed to getting the facts right. Um, and, you know, sometimes the facts are inconvenient. I mean, sometimes folks don't like the results, um, but they, I think, can trust that it is not politically motivated. Um, but I, I do think the one of the reasons that we've had this project on Truth Decay at Rand is because we realize um, this is not only an important issue for American society, it's, it's also an important issue for analytic institutions like RAND, whose entire business is organized around trying to figure out what the truth is. What, what type of change are you hoping to drive in RAND within the organization? 
Yeah, we need to um, figure out how to how to design um, analytic tools and analytic processes that are well fit for the kinds of challenges that we face in the 21st century. I think we had a we had a set of tools and processes um, that we developed in you know the early years of RAN and continued to refine, and I think many of those are are still just as relevant today. Um, I'll give one example, which is. Uh, um, I asked Andy Marshall once, what are the most important methodological innovations uh, that Rand made? And uh, I said, you know, was it was it the advances in deterrence theory and game theory, rational choice, uh, some of the modeling uh, simulation work? And he said, no, it wasn't any of that. The most important uh, methodological contributions from Rand was in war gaming. Um, he said those the war games were the things that actually got decision makers to realize that they had made assumptions that weren't realistic. Um, it allowed decision makers to run through a variety of, of scenarios, test different strategies, see where they broke down. Um, and I thought that was a really interesting insight. I mean, the that's not the fancy analytic work. I mean, the, the war gaming work is, um, does not tend to involve, you know, something that you could publish up as a um, as a new, you know, research methodology paper, it's it's more about you know getting real decision makers to a table and having them work through a bunch of of different scenarios, um, and a lot of that work ends up being highly classified because the details of the war games actually matter. Uh, we probably conduct more classified war games than I think you know any other think tank or institution, and the the output of that is something that I think continues to be among the most valuable things that RAND does. So I think that that is an example of something that's a 20th century innovation that I think is just as relevant today. Um, but there are other things that we can do now that we couldn't do in the 50s or 60s. Uh, for example, you know, massively crowdsource analysis. We just didn't have the tools for that. You know, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have um, we didn't have a way of, of distributing analytic work um, or questions um, to expertise that was widely distributed. Um, and I think we also, um, you know, we'll, we'll need to be thinking a lot about how we fully leverage um, advances in, in AI for analysis. So, um, you know, you seem like a really nice person. And I feel like it's a, it's a very different leadership challenge um, doing something like CSET, where you kind of get to build it from scratch with all your own people and your own team versus, you know, taking an organization that already exists and, you know, trying to, um, as, a, as someone wrote about the 1960s Rand, you know, uh, scrape off some bureaucratic encrustation and uh, bend it a little more in the direction that you think it would be relevant in the future. How has that effort personally been, um, uh, been for you? And maybe what have you learned um, from that over the past year? Yeah, I think, you know, I've worked within organizations that are, you know, brand new, um, uh, like CSET, um, organizations that are kind of new, but you've already got like a ton of process that you have to work within, like, uh, like IARPA, organizations that are, are pretty old and have even more process, um, you know, like the, uh, the National Security Council. Um, and, and Rand is, uh, you know, is in that category and that we have, we have, you know, 75 years of, of history. Um, it's a mid-sized organization. So there's, you, you know, you have to be very careful about making like structural changes uh, that are just going to affect 2000 people's lives. And, um, you know, are, you're going to take um, more effort to, to change and are also going to take more effort to undo if you find out that it was a mistake, whatever change it is that you wanted to make. Um, so I, I think, um, I think a lot of the things that I found in common across those organizations are that um, hiring and promotion are incredibly important. You know, among the most important decisions we can make are just about um, about personnel. Um, you know, there's the the line about personnel is is policy, uh, but I mean personnel is is at the heart of like any of of these organizations um, likelihoods of success. I mean, kind of you know most of the variance in the outcome of a of a project is related to the people who are who are working on it. Um, so I think spending a lot of time really thinking about the people who are on a project, how to get the right team working on a project is, is essential. And for 
for Rand, but I think also for CSET um, and other places that I've worked, it, it's a combination of finding people who are not just brilliant and hardworking, but also kind. And I think the kindness part is often underrated. I think sometimes managers think like, well, so-and-so is a jerk, but they're so brilliant that it's worth hiring them or it's worth keeping them on. In my experience, that very rarely works out. The, the work that I've done has been predominantly team-based and no one wants to be on a team with a jerk. So if you hire jerks, you lose the other talent on your team. Um, I do think it makes sense to have organizations that have a high tolerance for, for eccentricity and quirkiness. It's one of the things that I um, you know, love about uh, the places that I've, I've worked, uh, you know, IRPA, CSET, and RAND. RAND is, uh, has, has a, a ton of quirkiness that I adore. Um, but there isn't an unkindness there's, and there, I don't think there's room for that. Um, I also think that, that, uh, interpersonal compassion is pretty highly correlated with impersonal and intergenerational compassion of the sort that I think we're going to need a lot of, if we're going to safely navigate the challenges, um, head. But so far I found that the changes that we've made within RAND to, you know, make process more efficient to figure out how to take on these, these big challenges. They're not ones that have required, you know, that I be, um, you know, giving orders from the mountaintop, you know, on, on stone tablets or whatever. I mean, it's actually something that the researchers here have been really enthusiastic about taking on these big problems um, and of reducing the amount of, of process and, and bureaucracy. Um, so I, I think it's um, it's going pretty well. I'm actually I'm, I'm really optimistic about the, the things that we're doing here. How do you test for kindness in an interview, like at a more tactical level? Like, what are you, what have you found works and doesn't? You can just, we, we tend to do a fair amount of interviewing um, at RAND. I mean, I think our, our researchers come in and have, you know, several different interviews in different settings and with different groups of researchers. Among the questions that are asked are, you know, describe a situation where, um, you know, somebody that you were working with was really struggling with, you know, personal issue, you know, how did you help them with it? Uh, so first, you know, kind of questions about interpersonal compassion. Um, some in some of the interview panels that we have, particularly for, for some roles that are focused on kind of long term issues, like, how do you think about compassion towards future generations that are going to be affected by a policy decision? Um, I don't think we have any any sort of, you know, magic solution to figuring out um, how to uh, make sure that folks that we hire are kind and compassionate. There's some amount of self-selection and that they're given um, a lot of clarity that the work that they're going to be doing is, is team-based. They're going to be interacting a lot with other people. And somebody who's your boss on a project one day um, might be working for you the next day because the, the teams themselves shift. Um, you know, you've got principal investigators on one project who are team members on other projects, team members who have become principal investigators on another project. Um, so that it's relatively flat in that the, the researchers um, sort of mix up the hierarchy constantly, just depending on the project. That itself, I think, also reinforces a need for, um, for compassion. Um, is uh, you, you, you don't know who you're going to be um, working for, whether you're going to be the boss um, on the next uh, project. Jason, you mentioned recently that you were really excited about potentially standing up a uh, analytic effort to take a multidisciplinary approach to understanding China. Um, by one of your board members counts, you only have a dozen or so deep China experts on staff. Um, how, uh, you know, what's the What's the pathway to being uh, to, to have Rand turning into what um, what it was for um, for the USSR uh, during the Cold War? Yeah, we, we actually have we did the sort of math on this recently as as part of an assessment of our our China work. I mean, we we have a, a closer to about thirty um, China specialists um, at Rand. I still think it's it's too small um, uh, at sort of the height of the Soviet studies program. Um, at RAND, uh, we had a little under a hundred, um, Soviet specialists. And I, I think we, you know, need something of, of that scale. Um, and I do think that China studies, you know, has to be an interdisciplinary research agenda, you know, has to involve political scientists and economists and statisticians and linguists and sociologists and technologists. Um, I think RAND has comparative advantages here. 
um, because we, um, because of our scale and because of our, our sort of disciplinary breadth, um, we probably also do have, I mean, I, I think probably, you know, having 30, 30 China specialists might already make us, you know, the, the largest of the efforts focused on, on China, um, in terms of its, um, especially on the military analysis side, but but also on the economic side, um, but we need to be doing more. And I think um, uh, the Soviet studies program at Rand is sort of an interesting model in that we had what was then the largest analytic effort in the U.S. and we had you know demographers and economists and linguists. I think a large scale effort like that focused on China's economy, its industrial policy, um, its bureaucratic process. I think really understanding China's internal decision making um, is is pretty essential. Um, and, you know, closely analyzing the type of advice that Xi Jinping is, is probably receiving um, and what kinds of biases um, are embedded within that process. Um, I think that is going to be really vital. Um, and we just need to be doing more of that. So what what's what are the limiting factors currently? One of them is flexible funding. Um, we we do a lot of military analysis of of China. Um, there is much less federal funding for understanding China's bureaucracy. Um, uh, I think you know the intelligence community um, was slow to pivot towards you know China's. Um, a, an increased focus of analysis. Um, and I think even within the sort of China portfolio, really thinking about um, bureaucracy as a, um, as a subject of intelligence analysis um, has, been, has been slow. Um, you know, science and t technology has been um, a, a faster, um, although not as fast as I think, you know, you or, or I might, might like. Um, but, but I think really understanding the forms of decision making, um, the potential um, failure modes of decision making um, within Xi's early, you know, uh, inner circle is, I think, something that um, is really important for us to understand. Um, where is she getting information about, um, uh, about uh, emerging threats, emerging risks. Um, how does that, uh, you know, balance across the the different um, uh, bureaucratic politics um, with within the PRC, and how does it um, how does it shape up into um, a mix of of decisions that are going to affect um, whether it's uh, you know decisions about deployment of new technologies or decisions about Taiwan timelines. Um, I think increasing our clarity around those questions um, is is going to be really important. Those are the kinds of questions that um, uh, that's harder to get government funding for. Um, uh, they they seem oftentimes more abstract, or it's it's like, well, do we really need you know sociologists and political scientists trying to analyze um, uh, the PRC bureaucracy? I'd say like most of the the work that was probably most important um, during the Cold War that the United that um, that Rand did about in the Soviet Studies program was actually focused on this question of like how does the Kremlin actually make decisions, um, and what are its red lines, and you know the the risks of escalation just due to these uh, sort of strange bureaucratic politics. So I I think that's important. I think um, by default it's understudied and underfunded. Yeah, the, the operational code of the Politburo lights from uh, right. 1951 is a classic, which is worth um, uh, worth revisiting. And it's you know, it's it always it, it's it's funny because those are the books about China that I like the most. The ones that just like, you know, researchers just like interview 200 officials and like try to, you know, piece together a little corner of how uh, of how the, the, the Chinese party state works. Um, but. I don't know. There's like one that comes out every year, which is really depressing. Uh, and it's only going to get harder, if not impossible, to do that research. Uh, yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, I'm, I'm worried about our, our data sources are, are dwindling. Um, I also think, you know, I know we've talked in the past about um, about uh, sort of how um, the analysis of bureaucracies 
is really important for thinking about strategy. And one um, one thing I, I really appreciated about Andy Marshall um, after he moved from from Rand to to government and the work that he did at Net Assessment, it was a common analytic line of effort uh, that that Andy uh, pursued, which was to think about um, bureaucracies as an important variable in um, in decision making. Um, and it it really I think influenced a lot of his thinking about risk um, of, uh, of of nuclear policy. Um, for example, I think there was, um, you know, he he um, he was accustomed to thinking about how nasty things can get in the world, not because of rational strategies, but because of different kinds of bureaucratic pressures um, that happen um, within governments. Um, and I think while a lot of national security thinkers, you know, will say, well, it wouldn't be rational for a state program to do X or Y, you know, to um, launch a nuclear attack or to release a biological agent that, that you could have blowback on its own population. Um, I think Andy Marshall believed, you know, we regularly underestimate the risk tolerance and pain tolerance of of states and political leaders, especially autocrats, um, but that we also underestimate these like peculiar effects of bureaucracies on decision making. Um, and to, to give like biological weapons as an example, you know, the Soviet Union had uh, a large, a very large biological weapons program. And each of these laboratories that were part of the program had their own interests in expanding the programs because they created prestige, they created, you know, job security, they um, they created um, uh, a lot of advantages for the bureaucrats who could get promotions. And in order to do all that, then you need to give scientists interesting problems to work on so that your lab can attract, you know, the best scientists and you've got bragging rights then. And so some of those sort of world ending pathogens that the Soviet biological weapons program were working on were really the product, not of some kind of strategic analysis that suggested, oh, this would be a really valuable weapon to have. Uh, but instead, because they were things that bureaucrats could brag about, they were things that could be technically sweet um, for the, uh, the biologists to be working on. You know, if you want to bring together a bunch of smart biologists and say, like, build nasty weapons, um, it can be a pretty irresistible intellectual property, um, you know, to, to have this like modified pox virus whatever. So you end up with this arsenal that doesn't make any strategic sense. It only makes sense given the sociology of, of bureaucracies and technical communities. And um, I think uh, more analysis of that, of that kind of sociology within these communities that could end up being really important for what happens in um, the next few decades is important. It's, it's really understudied. Yeah, there's, I got a fun quote from you from Dr. Olabek, who was a, uh, a led a bio um, lab in the Soviet Union, talking about like why the Soviet, why the USSR, on the one hand, was like helping to rid the world of smallpox, while at the same time, like, like d creating like the killer smallpox that could end humanity. And he says, um, uh, you know, when we're talking about smallpox and uh, uh, smallpox and plague biological weapons. Um, you know, look, they'd be used, but they used be used in total war. And the the rationale, which sort of allowed the downstream bureaucratic stuff that you just talked about, Jason, to flourish was, quote, you know, guys, the U.S. is evil. They want to destroy our country. So we need to do everything in our power to create very sophisticated and powerful weapons to protect our country. And sort of once you have that as a premise, then all the other stuff can end up playing out. And it's scary that, um, you know, we're we're entering maybe a universe, uh, you know, a timeline in which that type of logic ends up um, having weight in a way it hasn't really for the past thirty years. And I think um, I think the uh, the risks of, um, of biological weapons uh, being used intentionally or accidentally is is increasing, and and you know we've seen lab accidents in biological weapons labs before. Um, that have, have been like close calls. I mean, like 79 in Sverdlovsk was a close call that it was, you know, anthrax rather than smallpox. Um, and, you know, the Soviet Union was developing smallpox that was resistant to vaccines and antivirals. So there's lots of nastiness, unfortunately, in biological weapons programs that exist today, um, in labs that exist today that are making these sorts of weapons. 
And I think uh, we underestimate the risk either of a lab accident or of a miscalculation um, by either a desperate leader, um, an autocrat who's getting bad advice, um, or by an insider within one of the labs who decides to use this pathogen uh, because of some nationalist fervor. So I, I think it's a, a whole, it's a, it's a place um, within the security landscape that is just filled with risk. You talked about sort of like weird organizational incentives, um, warping policy decisions. Uh, can you take, take that, um, you know, take that thought and apply it to the extent you're comfortable about your, your years in the White House? Like, what do you think you learned um, from that experience about how um, s and policy gets made in America? Uh, I mean, first, I think the um, the people I worked with were some of the you know smartest and hardest working um, and and most compassionate people that I've I've ever worked with. So it was just the phenomenal human capital there. Um, there's I think there's a few challenges in working in the White House. One of them is that there's the the sort of tyranny of the immediate, right? There's like lots of urgent problems. Um, and they, some of them are both urgent and important, and some of them are just urgent. And so that, you know, the Eisenhower matrix of, you know, urgent and important is like really something I just, we felt acutely all the time was, we know that there's a problem that's even more important, but carving out the time to work on it can be really challenging. Um, and I think if, if you look at the amount of time um, spent in different policy processes, um, as a you know, as a proportion of the total, the the fractions would not align with what you might think of as being like the most important problems for the the country to tackle. And it's not it's not because the the people at the White House sort of think like, oh, well, the things that we're spending the most time on are the most important. It's just that there is there's timelines for each of these. You know, if if the president has a meeting with the ambassador from country X, even if country X is is the thing that is maybe not the most important thing um, that's going to affect, you know, the next 50 years in the United States, um, he's got to have that meeting and you've got to prep him for it. And um, uh, there's a lot of that sort of um, uh, timing that influences how um, attention is budgeted um, in the White House. So I think that's that's one thing that I was just, I, you know, I'd read this, of course, in like histories of the National Security Council, but I hadn't a- appreciated it. It's a really hard thing to be, to um, to figure out how to balance. And, um, you know, there have been various calls for like restructuring the National Security Council so that it has, you know, like a warning function and can do like longer range analysis. It's just really hard to do that within the White House because there's so many other uh, time pressures. One thing that I think was helpful was um, because I worked both in the National Security Council and in the Office of Science Technology Policy, um, OSTP had um, a sort of the luxury of being able to work on longer range analysis. So we were able to get um, OSTP to, um, to be able to give kind of sufficient room for analysis about, you know, supply chains and about kind of move and counter move and technology competition. Um, we could think a lot about, you know, AI safety and biosecurity on longer timelines than we typically would be able to in the NSC. I think doing more like that, finding ways to leverage other parts of, of the White House that are able to have like a little bit more room to think is helpful. Um, I also think, you know, um, the, uh, there's, there are some problems that are likely to be, you know, thousands, maybe even millions of times more important than others. I remember I had this experience. Uh, I used to um, work on this thing called the Disease Control Priorities Project about 20 years ago uh, when I worked in global health. And one of the insights from that was there are interventions that are like, you know, 10,000 times more cost effective than other interventions. And, um, you know, malaria bed nets can be like 10,000 times more cost effective than, you know, building a new hospital in the middle of Egypt. Um, and yet we uh, we don't often appreciate just how cost effective um, uh, something can be. Um, and so I think doing the math on um, even rep order of magnitude of like the consequence of policy decisions 
is something we we don't often do, um, but could do more of. Another thing is doing like incorporating more sort of Kahneman and Tversky, Tetlock, Mellers type insights into human judgment and decision making into the policy process itself. Um, we don't do much pre-mortem analysis. We don't do much adversarial collaboration, which is a really interesting, I think, approach to settling certain kinds of disagreement. We don't do like crux maps. Um, we tend not to use um, probabilities. Um, I think a, a lot of uh, policy process um, could probably be improved if we used a little bit more of what we've learned from judgment and decision-making research um, over the last few decades. And I think more red teaming of, of analysis. Um, you know, like one thing that we had um, thought about was, you know, just um, like having a group uh, whose sort of permanent responsibility is to imagine how China would react to certain kinds of policies um, and have that group like really thoroughly embedded in, you know, Xi Jinping thought and sort of live day in, day out, um, uh, immersed in, um, in sort of like PRC media um, and sort of do the best simulation or emulation of, um, of, of Politburo thinking. Um, I think that's, that's probably really useful. I mean, I, I think it's at least worth testing. Um, and uh, so I think, you know, running these kinds of experiments on analytic process and policy process um, would be, a, a, you know, it seems worth trying at least. So um, a, uh, a two-time guest to uh, China Talk, Dan of FP21, gets really frustrated um, when uh, folks in government say foreign policy is an art, not a science. And it seems like you were definitely, um, from that last answer, sort of excited about bringing some more science into these, you know, I guess, art, uh, you know, things that 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 folks are very attached to it as being sort of my personal judgment as the thing that I'm here for that's most valuable to the principal or the president and, um, you know, less comfortable and in, in, in sort of leaning into the, the you know, decision making under deep uncertainty stuff or just um, uh, the idea that different methodological approaches to making um, uh, decision making in the, you know, to, to improving decision making around national security and technology um, could potentially bring. Um, is that a generational thing? Like, how does that end up changing and getting more into the into the bloodstream of these sorts of organizations? I mean, I think for me, it was it was just exposure to um, to the work in judgment and decision making that had been um, you know, done over the last um, 40 or so years. And I mean, there's just such a wealth of knowledge that we've generated um, over that time period about how human beings actually make decisions, um, uh, what influences their judgments, what kinds of practices can lead to better judgments and better decisions. And I, I think very little of that research has actually penetrated um, public policy decision making. I don't know quite how to explain it. Um, I mean, you would you would sort of think that um, policymakers might be incentivized to make better decisions, and that then they would use whatever um, <laughs> empirical findings that we had from how to make better decisions. But I think one, there's there's not necessarily super strong incentives um, for improving our decision making processes, and we also see the same kinds of failures in businesses um, that have like very strong financial incentives um, to uh, make better decisions and yet also aren't, um, you know, adopting um, some of the, the lessons learned from, from research on, on human judgment. Um, I, I actually asked uh, uh, Phil Tatlock and Barb Miller this question recently, and they just pointed out, you know, in many cases, the incentives are not aligned with individual managers to be making decisions that are objectively better. Um, they they might be motivated to make decisions that appear better or safer um, in some ways um, to whoever determines you know their salaries or their professional futures. So something that they can defend to a board of directors. Uh, if you propose to a board of directors, hey, I want more of our decisions to be made on the basis of you know betting markets or uh, pre mortem analysis or crux maps. Um, the board of directors might be pretty mystified by all that. It's not clear that they would um, necessarily want to endorse it. So I think there is just generally um, a challenge in overcoming 
um, the the lack of awareness of of some of these methods um, that have you know that test really strongly when we actually um, evaluate them. Um, and there's also a challenge in that um, some of the highest stakes decisions that we make in in policy are not necessarily ones that have strong incentives for making the um, the right decision or an, or an accurate judgment. All right, Jason, say you can stop time and um, uh, you have a year to sort of like personally run your own RAND research pod with, you know, five or six people and a $2 million budget. Like what, what's the topic that you as an individual would like to be able to, um, uh, uh, to take on if you didn't have to do everything else you have to do? Yeah, I think... I mean, something like a strategic look at how we can put guardrails on on AI and synthetic biology, I mean, comparable to the guardrails that we put on nuclear technologies that can either be used, you know, for peaceful nuclear energy or can be used for producing nuclear weapons. And so we've we've thought pretty deeply about how we create those guardrails and nuclear technology so that you can get the benefit and reduce the risk. What are comparable guardrails for for AI and and synthetic biology? Um, if we didn't have to worry about catastrophic risks, I think I'd I'd want to spend more time thinking about how to design and deploy these mechanisms for making better analysis and better decisions. Um, and I you know I I really loved the Tetlock Mellers uh, tournament for you know judgments around geopolitical events, and I think doing more of that. Uh, would be something I would, I'd love to see. Coming back to the the sort of White House challenge of uh, focusing a lot of time on doing hard things that are really important. I assume you were involved in one of the more consequential decisions of uh, the this first term of the Biden administration, the, uh, the export controls on China, and clearly that was a sort of enor- that must have been an enormous institutional lift to um, um, to sort of uh, formulate and then uh, and then get those in shape. Um, what any sort of reflections on that process in particular, and then generally like how stars have to align for those sorts of um, major policy decisions to end up, um, you know, coming out of the executive branch? I, I think doing the analysis um, in a, a really detailed way and really understanding, you know, move and counter move and costs and benefits and being having a team that was really deep on um the the technical details of the chips what the chips can do um which thresholds are going to matter um how could the chips be used in the future um and get enough technical expertise both within government and you know from the national labs and elsewhere that can help advise on that um we were we were fortunate too in that there was you know work that um that some of us had done at at CSAT and at other you know, think tanks in advance, it's really hard to do a lot of the thinking while you're in the White House because there's so many demands on your time. So, you know, one of the advantages of the places like RAND and CSET is that you sort of have the luxury of being able to do the math and work out the analysis. Um, so we were able to draw on that. Um, I think the other big lesson is, um, you know, there it's something like that doesn't pass uh, unless, um, you know, a significant number of departments and department heads uh, agree with the with the approach. Um, so, um, you know, that policy process was very inclusive. It involved a lot of um, of agency heads, and their agencies, you know, I think reached the same conclusion for the same reasons um, uh, about why the the controls were warranted. Um, and I I think you know it's. Um, uh, semiconductors is pretty unusual in that it's one of the real like choke points with wide and deep moats um, in the global supply chain. But it's, in, of course, incredibly consequential um, for so many uh, strategic issues. And I think in, in thinking about China in particular and about China's ambitions in military modernization and its um, cyber operations and its human rights abuses, chips play a major role. And in all three of those categories, moonshot projects, can the government do these anymore? Should they? Um, And how can RAND support um, building or rebuilding that type of institutional capacity? Yeah, I mean, we still do moonshots. I mean, I think we, um, 
I mean, if you think about a project like the F-22, um, I mean, I, that costs more than the Apollo program. Um, so we still have these mega projects or giga projects and, you know, maybe all told some of the um, particular, you know, defense um, programs or terror projects. Um, I think, I think moonshots, the value of them depends. So a, a moonshot in the wrong direction um, can be worse than a small project in the right direction. Um, and small projects, you know, tend to allow more rapid error correction or course correction. Um, you know, to give one example, you know, there's increasing evidence that we underestimate the risks and overestimate uh, the benefits of gain of function research. So you wouldn't necessarily want like a moonshot for gain of function research. Um, a moonshot for AI capability might also end up being a net negative um, if you don't have already a deep foundation in AI security and, and AI safety. Um, so I think I agree with, with Richard Danzig here. He had a, a great paper called Technology Roulette. And I think one of the insights from that paper is you want to make sure that you're, um, that you're considering the risks of the technologies that you create. Um, you don't want to jump too far in the direction of developing a technology that's actually going to create asymmetric risk for yourself. Um, you might want to focus on defensive technologies or ones that have kind of a, um, uh, are uh, asymmetrically favor um, defense or safety. Um, you can think about sort of differential technology development that's focused on embedding safety and security from, from the start. And I think we, we do need these significant investments in things like AA safety, biosecurity, lab security, judgment, decision-making. Some of those might um, deserve moonshots, um, but I, I'd even be happy with, you know, something even getting us to like low earth orbit on some of those topics, even before getting to the moon on them. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, what, I think open AI, it's fair to say might be the most successful, like quote unquote moonshot project um we've seen over the past few decades and um you know maybe any any reflections you have jason on on since we've been talking so much about organizational design like what what you think has made them um so successful and any uh hopes and fears as um uh, as uh as open ai and other labs both in the u.s and china continue to um uh, explore what um ai is capable of i think open ai did a really admirable job of a lot of safety testing and red teaming. Um, which, I mean, they published this thing they called the system card uh, that was um, published at the same time as their main GPT-4 paper that documented the the kind of safety and security work um, that they did. And I've overall been impressed by um, the kind of analysis that they do about um, safety and security risks, which I think, you know, um, Sam Altman and Miles Brundage and um, Jade Lung and others on the, the team have been um, really thoughtful ab about. Um, it's also a, an interesting sort of organizational design because you've got, um, I think, a around 500 employees maybe at OpenAI. Um, and then it's able to leverage the computing infrastructure at, at Microsoft. So um, it's it kind of links back up to what we were talking about earlier that, uh, you know, sometimes when you've got... Um, like a mid-sized organization that's able to leverage the infrastructure of a much larger organization, um, there can be real benefits. You know, OpenAI didn't need to spend a lot of time, you know, building its own computing infrastructure. It could it could leverage that elsewhere, and of course, that's a big part of what makes these large language models uh, practical now. Yeah. So you know, apply that to Rand. I mean, should you should you are you thinking about splitting Rand into four little 500 person silos or, um, uh, you know, you, you, you mentioned in one interview, um, you're sort of excited to sort of explore different ways of organizing think tanks. Like what, uh, along what lines were you thinking when you, when you said that? Yeah. Rand, Rand has this interesting matrix structure in that we have, you know, research departments where the researchers are hired uh, into and, um, and sort of mentored, and then research divisions um, where the projects occur. And this allows the, the researchers to sort of mix and match along projects and different divisions. 
there are there are a few differences though. So RAND manages four federally funded research and development centers, which are kind of like think tanks that are for specific parts of the government. One is for the Secretary of Defense, one's for the Secretary of the Air Force, one's for the Secretary of the Army, and one's for the Secretary of Homeland Security. And those operate a little bit differently in that um, there's just a, a steady stream of, of funding. There's sort of a set of strategic priorities that RAND works on with um, the respective secretaries um, and their their deputies and their staff. Um, so the, those are uh, are groups of you know a few hundred um, people at, you know at any given time working on different projects. I, I do think we need to be thinking about what are the things that are um, that are truly cross cutting across you know our divisions. Um, and I think our China work is in that category. I think our technology work, our climate and energy work. Um, some of our work on things like, you know, strengthening democracies, resilience against truth decay, disinformation, political polarization. Um, a lot of our work on inequality and inequality and equity that crosses both across our domestic work as well as our global work. We actually we have seven offices, you know, at Rand, and um, three of them are overseas. So one is in the UK, one's in Australia, one's in in Brussels that supports sort of our uh, work with allies. And I think figuring out ways of, of leveraging, you know, the geographic reach that we have, the disciplinary reach that we have, the ability to work both unclassified and classified, the fact that we have our own graduate school as a pipeline for talent. The thing that I'm mainly interested in is can we find enough sort of diversification of operating models within RAND that we can run lots of micro experiments and we can have people sort of self-organized based on project type um, so that the organizational design matches what the project is attempting to do. Um, I think there's a ton of room for experimentation and actually for any listeners or readers who are really interested in organizational experiments, I think RAND is a great place to conduct those. I mean, historically we've had all sorts of different designs. Today we have probably at least a dozen different kinds of business models and operating models at, um, that are that are running in parallel. Uh, so it's a great place to run experiments like this. How do you think you've surprised um, both the board that hire you as well as RAND's employees? Um, you know, I think, I think folks pretty much knew what they were getting. I mean, you know, as somebody who um, came in knowing like a little about a a few areas of, of policy and, you know, not being an expert in a lot of the areas where, um, where RAND, um, where RAND works. I mean, we just, we have so many areas that I, I won't ever hope to be able to be an expert in most of the things that we work on. Um, but I think they also knew that I was, I was just going to be fully dedicated to making, um, RAND the best workplace that I, that I can make it and to make the work here easier in terms of, you know, kind of like reducing um, process spins and trying to make sure that we can, you know, like get to research results faster, um, support the staff in ways so that their, their lives are happier, but also like they can accomplish more with the the time that they put in um, and to be taking on the things that are, that are, you know, going to be incredibly consequential um, for the future um, of the country and the world. And I think having a sense of, um, you know, that like a sense of, of, uh, of optimistic urgency, um, as, as Andy Marshall put it, um, is I think a, a key part of that. Um, we don't need to feel that the, um, you know, that the world is a, about to end to have that sense of urgency. We can also just feel that the opportunities are so great. Um, you know, that there's, there's not only existential risk, there's also existential hope. Um, and I think that's real. I mean, I think, you know, we live in an extraordinary period where um, so many, so much technological change um, is, is happening that can have incredible applications to improving human health and human prosperity. Um, so if we can manage to navigate these risks and put in the guardrails, um, I think the, the upside potential ahead of us is, is phenomenal. Uh, Jason, uh, could I trouble you to make the case for going to an art museum? <laughs> Have you been talking to Richard Danzig? R you know, Richard, who I'm a huge fan of, I mentioned earlier is uh, his paper technology roulette. Uh, when, uh, when, 
when I was at IERPA, and then I, I think he, he offered the same to, to DARPA, he'd say like, why don't we go on a, a tour of an art museum and we can just point out the connections between um, depictions of technology and art and how it was sort of viewed in its time to how we think about technology today. And um, I do think art is a really interesting um, you know, set of artifacts that we can use to understand how society has changed. It's not a like perfect sample because of, you know, of course, like only a tiny percentage of people are responsible for producing the art that sits in museums today. And uh, only a tiny percentage were even able to um, see much of the art that uh, exists in museums today. But it, it is one instrument that we have for kind of recording um, uh, how people valued um, different things within society over different periods. Um, and I think uh, taking a, an art tour with Richard Danzig should probably be on, on all of our itineraries. Um, I think the other case to make for it is just using a different part of your brain um, so that you can give some parts of your brain a rest. Um, I, you know, I, I spend an, an awful lot of time, you know, thinking about and working on uh, depressing topics. And when, um, when I want to take a break, um, I often will like walk down to the Hirshhorn or the National Gallery and just um, try not to think about nuclear war or about um, pathogens uh, or cyber attacks and just think about these, these uh, beautiful um, pieces of art that are around me um, and just uh, uh, put myself uh, to rest for a bit. Um, I hope everybody, you know, has, has something like that um, that they can use to activate a different part of their brain. I tried to find your undergrad thesis, but I couldn't. What did you, uh, uh, Jason was a, as a art history uh, major for his undergrad. What did you, uh, what'd you write on? So I, I wanted to be an, an architect and I went to a, a college that, that didn't have an architecture school. Um, uh, I mean, I sort of, you know, realized I wanted to be an architect. Uh, I think, you know, after I had already started college, um, and I worked as a social worker in Cabrini Green, which was a housing project in Chicago. And one of the experiences of being a social worker there was building design can really impact um, the health and happiness and security of families. And I just wanted to design better uh, public housing, social housing, affordable housing. And because uh, the University of Chicago didn't have an architecture program, Art history was the way that I could write a thesis on on architecture. So you know, it was history of you know, kind of like social housing, and uh, and then I um, I went to architecture school actually for uh, for a year, and then in a, a library saw an orphaned copy of uh, the World Development Report from the World Bank. I think it was the 1993 report, and it included these. Um, these league tables of statistics on preventable deaths due to infectious diseases. And I had never really had any exposure to just the millions of deaths caused each year um, that were completely preventable, especially childhood deaths. And I, um, I was really stunned. Like I, I just, I couldn't believe that these tables were right. So I, uh, I asked some epidemiologists like, is this true? Really? And they were like, yeah, how did you not know about these like basic facts about the world that, you know, we have like 4 million plus uh, deaths for uh, children under five due to uh, these um, preventable diseases. And so then I, I moved to start working in, um, in public health and infectious disease control um, and worked on that for several years. Um, and then what brought me to national security was in 2002, I was working in India on a, a global health project on malaria and tuberculosis and HIV. And at the same time uh, uh, that I was working there, a virus was synthesized from scratch um, on a DARPA project. And just to see, you know, if this could be done. And it was sort of an oh crap moment for the public health community um, because it, it brought into focus that uh, pathogens could be developed uh, that might be much worse than existing pathogens, um, and that a virus that we had eradicated and controlled, like smallpox, could be recreated 
And some of the people I was working with in India were veterans of the smallpox eradication campaign. And they were like, oh man, you know, some like sophisticated misanthrope is just gonna recreate the smallpox virus. We're gonna have to go through this all over again. So that's what shifted me to um, to work in national security. And actually I, I cold called Andy Marshall um, because he was the only person I really knew from <laughs> the national security world. Uh, cause I had, you know, read a, a couple of these, you know, um, papers, uh, in college uh, about Rand and its early work. And, um, I wrote every Andrew dot something dot Marshall at Pentagon dot mill. Um, and I wrote all 26 of those variants. Um, and I think like four or five wrote back and one of them was Andy Marshall, Andy W. Marshall. Um, so I, I lucked out and that, um, uh, you know, he encouraged me to come talk about the future of uh, bio risks and other risks. Um, uh, and that sort of got me uh, started in national security. So, uh, Jason, in, a, in another interview I saw of yours, you were talking to a group of young people and you told them you should start working on catastrophic risk as soon as you can, because I like wasted 10 years of my life not working on catastrophic risk. But like, look at you, you guys have all this uh, runway ahead of you as long as you get started now. And I think that the conversation that we were able to just have about sort of organizational design and incentives and whatnot, um, you can you can probably find a line from thinking about, um, you know, the way public housing buildings are built and, and, and laid out all the way to uh, your sort of interest here. So I would not encourage everyone to only have uh, a sort of a laser focus optimization function on whatever they think is the most uh, impactful thing they can do today, because there's a lot of uncertainty and there's a lot you don't know as a young person. And like being able to sort of bring different perspectives um, to these really important questions is the way you'll probably end up having the most differentiated impact. So um, maybe a final question to close and maybe a suggestion to you as well, Jason, is um, for your um, six month pausing of the world, I'd love to see you, you know, pick up that um, uh, that drafting pen and redesign the the White House and the uh, and EEOB to help with better um, decision making. I want to see what um, uh, blueprints you have planned for um, uh, the twenty seventy renovation. Great, great. Okay, I will. Um, I'll get to work on an outline. Great idea, Jason Matheny. Thank you so much for being part of China. Jordan, thank you so much. Thanks for all the the great discussion and and really um, thank you so much for what you've produced through through China Talk and through your other analytic work. I mean, I think you've helped us to understand China much more deeply uh, than than we had before.